right, I went through several things this morning as far as teaching goes, and I wasn't real sure what I wanted to do. And then one of the things I was studying this week, the pastor has been on this kick of prayer. And so I've been working on trying to change my prayer life. And I came across a, a lesson, and I'm plagiarizing most of this this morning. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and tell everybody. This is not all mine. Part of it is, but most of it is from another gentleman that I like to read his work. And it's talking about radical prayers. And I think as Christians, you know, this is not for, for immature Christians. And I think as Sunday school, uh, everybody that comes here, I'd like to consider us all mature, not mature adults, because we both know that I'm probably the most immature here, but mature Christians. And so we need to change the way that we pray. And so I want to look at that this morning. Um, and so some of this stuff, like I said, I'm going to be reading because I'm still going through it. It's not one of mine that I put together, but I wanted to to share this with you because it helped change some things in me just this week. And so I'm hoping that as we move into this time of revival, as we move into just this time in our lives, we live in a very strange world right now. Um, it seems like last year everything was crumbling down. This year we start to see things change a little bit, but some of the changes we see are not good. Uh, um, and, and we know that the end times are coming. And I think when we get closer to that, we all need the strongest prayer life that we could ever have during that time. And so this morning is going to be about that. We'll be in Genesis, I think for the most part, I think I'll jump around some, but Genesis 32. Um, but I want to start with a story uh, that this gentleman starts with. Gordon is the pastor's name. I'll give him credit there. Uh, there once was a man who was very faithful in his prayer life. Every morning when he got up, he would kneel by his bed and he would pray, God bless me, God bless my family, God bless this day. Sounds like a prayer we all do, right? And before every meal, he would say a prayer, God bless his food. And every night before he went to bed, he would pray, God bless me, God bless my family, God bless this night. And every time he prayed, he would take a walnut and place it in a jar. Over the years, his house became full of glass jars that were full of walnuts. They were on the shelves, bookcases, window sills, everywhere. Walnuts, thousands of them. And the man felt very pleased with himself because he could see every time they'd pray, he'd see one of these walnuts there. Just look at all these jars. Look at all these walnuts. Look at all these prayers that I have prayed, he would say. Then one night, Jesus appeared to him in a dream, and Jesus took each one of the glass jars, opened them up, and one by one, he took out the walnuts and broke them open. Inside, each one was empty, nothing but dryness and dust. And Jesus said to him, you know, your prayers are like that. Although there have been thousands of them, they are empty, they are dry, and they are meaningless. When I read this story, I thought, oh, well, that hits home. Because how many times do we pray? We say the words, the stuff that we've always heard, the stuff that we know we're supposed to say, but the words are hollow. It's just like we're going through the motions. And so it hit me hard when I first started reading the story, and I thought, oh, okay. So we want to look at what we call radical prayer. There's a book by Derek Morse, and he opens up that says, all too often we simply pray weak prayers such as, dear God, help me to have a nice day. And help me not to get angry today. Some of us face anger issues. Mm -hmm. All right? So we'll say a simple prayer like, please help me not to be angry today. Help me to control my temperature. Now, that's a good prayer. I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of this. But I want us as mature Christians to go deeper. I want us to go a little bit further into this. So uh, they can be short. But certainly, I mean, uh, let's see, I got ahead of myself. But Jesus challenges each one of his followers to pray radical prayers. They can be short, but they're certainly not weak. If you maintain the status quo, and that's going to be kind of a theme through this, don't even uh, begin this prayer. Or if you want to live an average life, keep doing what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, that's what you're going to get. But if we want to see change within us, change within the church, change within the community, change within our government, Christians need to change the way they pray and start changing and getting a more in-depth, more uh, a prayer that's going to be different. So once you begin to try to pray radical prayers in faith, they'll open for great and wonderful things to happen. Your life will truly be transformed. So challenging words, but true. This is all from his book. Uh, many of the prayers of the church and of God's people are weak, empty, and passionless. 
And I, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I, I literally, I'm not putting down anybody's prayers. I want to hear people pray. I like hearing people pray. But let me ask you a question. Some of your prayers, just in your own mind right now, go through some of your prayers. If you spoke to your significant other, or if you spoke to your boss the way that you pray, would they even listen to you half the time? Because some of those prayers that we pray tend to be pretty shallow, don't they? I mean, I'm sorry, but I can tell you some of my prayers. Uh, if I came up to you and started talking to you and, and was talking with the depth that I have with some of my prayers, you'd be going, please God, tell him to shut up so I can move on. Because they would mean nothing. And so we need to change that. We need to realize that every single time we pray, we're praying to the God of the universe. The God who keeps all this going. And I think we miss that a lot of times. We forget who we're speaking to. So, are you a prayer? Are you a wrestler? Are you an interceder? We need a, to be a church. We need to be a people who are serious about prayer. We are serious about grappling with God over bigger issues of the world. We need to be a church that starts praying some radical prayers. So, what is a radical prayer? The word radical comes from the Latin radix, which means root. Now, I didn't understand this. I didn't know what this meant. Now, it's one of those things. This is, this is me where I was doing some study. That means radical prayer goes straight to the root of the issue. I like that. That's what we're trying to do, right? When you pray, if you're just saying, God, give me a good day. I'm done. I'm out of here. Well, when God hears that, what's he going to say? I mean, give you a good day? What's a good day? What are you asking for? What are you looking for in your day? So radical prayer refuses to let us stay on the fringes of life's great issues, floating around on the surface, so to speak, never getting too involved in the things that really matter. It dares to believe that things can be different. Now, this is important. Radical prayers enables God. Listen to this. Radical prayers enables God to change the world through you. Think about that. Most of the time when we pray, we're praying for us, which is good. We're praying for the things in our life, which is important to us. God wants us to. That's what your kids come to you. You want to help them, right? That's what. But as Christians, one step further, we're supposed to be changing the world, right? This world outside is dying and going to hell. If we don't start praying more radically about what we can do in our lives to change this world. This world has no hope. Like I said last week or week before last or whenever it was last time, they have no hope without us. And so we need to start praying radically. So I want to look at the life of Jacob here in uh, Genesis. But before we start, I want to share with you three more uh, things this morning about radical prayer uh, that came come straight from this story of Jacob. Now, I, all of you have heard this story. This is not going to be anything new to you. Uh, Jacob had not seen his brother Esau in a very long time, right? So um, you may remember the story years ago he had tricked his brother. Remember he tricked him out of his birthright. I don't know if you guys remember the story. It's a great story. Go back and read it. But he had tricked his brother Esau out of his birthright. Now he's been in hiding for several years. He's been staying away from him because he knows his brothers told him he's going to kill him the next time he sees him. So he's staying as clear away from, from Esau as he can because he's scared of him. Uh, Jacob's mother found out about Esau's plan and she arranged for Jacob to live with relatives far away. Uh, now, after many years had gone, God tells Jacob to go back home. But he's terrified that his brother Esau still wants to kill him. Now, this is many years has happened through all this time. So he comes to uh, the Jabbok River and crossing it means crossing into Esau's territory. So before the crossing, uh, the river, Jacob decides that he would try to appease his brother. I don't know if you guys remember the story. So what he does is, and I think it's very cowardly, but this is my take on it too. He decides he's going to send over some gifts. He sends servants ahead. Now, you've got to realize if Esau is truly angry with him, he's sending servants over. He's sending his family over. He's sending his wife and kids over in hopes that this is going to appease Esau. Well, what if it hadn't? What if Esau just said, and killed them all? I mean, very cowardly in my mind. But anyway, I'm reading into the story, my own take on it. But anyway, he sends over a gift. 220 goats, 220 sheep, 30 camels, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 30 donkeys. And as he was making his preparations, he said to himself, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. And later we'll see... 
whether he receives them or not. And that's Genesis 32, 20. Like I said, if you want to go in, I'm going to be skipping around. I'm not even really going to read it. We know the story, but you guys can kind of follow along with what it says. Now, his plan doesn't work. His servants come back with the message. We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you with 400 men, soldiers. That's in 32, 6. And it says that Jacob was in great fear and distress. Well, of course he was. He was going home because God told him to go home to make amends with his brother. And now he sent over all these gifts saying, brother, please forgive me. I know I did wrong. Please forgive me. That's how he was going to handle it. And then he hears a story back that his brother's coming at him with 400 soldiers. Well, that's not the story you want to hear, is it? So that brings me to the first thing I want to say about radical prayer. Radical prayer challenges the status quo. So things weren't looking too good for Jacob. The situation looked hopeless. His angry brother was coming toward him with 400 men. It looked like this could be the end for him. But radical prayer refuses to accept, accept the status quo. Radical prayer refuses to believe that the things have to be the way that they appear. Now, I love this story. Uh, the great reformer Martin Luther said, The might of prayer is so great it has overcome both heaven and earth. And he speaks of conquering God through prayer. Now, did you hear that? That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But we're going to read this story here in just a minute, and we're going to see what we're talking about. In the sense that we are seeking to bind God. Ooh, now I'm getting crazy. Bind God to his word. Can God lie? He cannot lie. Is there anything can't, God can't do? Yes, there is. I found out this week there is one thing God can't do. I always said he could. He can't lie. Okay, so he can't lie. So there's one thing God can't do. But the fact that is, when we can go to God's word and we can say, God, you said in your word, we can bind God to those promises, can't we? That's not taking steps out of our league. It's not being overzealous. That's not being so bold that we're going to get struck down by lightning when I walk out the door. That is simply holding God to His Word. And we'll see how that works here. Um, we can hold God to, or bind God to His Word. It says, look God, you said. Look God, you promised. That's how you do this in your prayer life. This brings up another problem, and I'm jumping way ahead, but... Do you know what God's Word said? Do you know what His Word says about the particular situation you're going through? Do you know that the things that you're praying for, are they in God's Word? If they are, and you know what they say, then you can go say, God, you said in your Word, and I'm going to bind you to that. Well, God's okay with that. We'll see that here in a minute. Okay, so that's exactly what Jacob did. Faced with the hostility of his brother, faced with certain death, he got on his knees and he held God to his promises. Let's look at Genesis 39, or 32, 9 through 12. And uh, y'all will probably be there long before me. So, all right. Genesis 32, 9 through 12. And we're going to read that. It says, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, and Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of these mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over the Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou said, here it is, and thou said, how many times have we done this with God? You said God, but he said, and thou said, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So right here, we got Jacob saying, God, you said you told me to come back and that you would bless me and that you would make my descendants as multitude or as multiple as the sands of the sea. So he's holding God to his word now. Well, you'd still think he wouldn't have any fear, but he's still fearful, right? But yet he's holding God to his promises now. So that's what he does. So Jacob prayed, O God, my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, go back to your country and for your, or to your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant, blah, blah, blah. So we're going down to the same thing I just read. And so when he was, uh, or, and he will make us prosper. Okay, so now when he was wrestling with God, 
What do you think he meant when he said, I will not let you go until you bless me? See, we get into the wrestling match. This is one of my favorite stories. I used to wrestle in high school, loved it. Went to state a couple of times, did great. I enjoyed wrestling. It was me against somebody else. It wasn't a team sport, it was, because you counted your points. But yet, I had to rely on myself to whether I was going to win or not. So I always liked wrestling because of that. Well, here Jacob is now wrestling with God. He's wrestling with Jesus, right? We know the story. Angel comes. They begin to wrestle all night. So when he's wrestling with God, he says one thing. He says, I will not. Yeah. He says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now, when we say blessings, what do you think of? Anybody? If I say I'm looking for blessings in my life, most people are talking about prosperity, right? They're talking about financial blessings. They're talking about maybe spiritual blessings. They're talking about when they walk outside, the sun or the, the rain's going to fall pennies from heaven and I'm going to become rich. We start talking about blessings. That's typically what people talk about. That's not what Jacob was talking about here. Jacob said, or he was talking about, I won't let you go until you bless me. He wasn't talking about prosperity. He was talking about God, or he wasn't talking about God giving him more wealth. Anyone who can give away 220 goats, 220 sheep, 30 camels, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 30 donkeys has got plenty of wealth. All right, he's, he's wealthy. He's, he's doing good for himself. I mean, I got one jet. Oh, no, wait, no, that's, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> but no, so, so he was wealthy. That wasn't a problem. Uh, Jacob wants to be blessed by being reconciled with his brother. That's what he was praying for. Simple reconciliation. He says, look, God, you said, look, God, you promised, and now I'm going to let, or I'm not going to let you go until it happens. That's a pretty radical prayer, isn't it? When he starts wrestling with God, physically wrestling with God, and he realizes that he's wrestling with a supernatural being here. He's wrestling with something he doesn't understand, and this, this angel... Jesus, we know now, is is telling them to let him go. Let him go. The morning's coming up. Let me go. And Jacob's saying, I'm not going to let you go until you do what you said you were going to do. Now, that's pretty radical. Now, is this, was it a physical wrestling match? Yes, it was. Because it says the angel touched his hip and it was dislocated, disjointed. So it was real. When we wrestle with God, all right, taking this home for a second, let me back up. When's the last time you wrestled with God about something? When's the last time you went to God so, so deep, so hurt, so in so much, or you wanted something, desired something so much that you wrestled with God about what you were trying to do? Wrestle with what is God's will for my life? Uh, because a lot of times we don't know God's will, do we? The Bible kind of teaches us things that we know God wants for our lives. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be prosperous, meaning fruitful in our Christian walk. All right? Uh, now, you may be the poorest person in this earth, but if you have led people to Christ or you have shared the gospel, you can be one of the richest people. So there's a different way to look at prosperity. So what are we looking at? But when's the last time you truly wrestled with God about anything? When was the last time your prayer was more than just words that come out of your mouth and then you went on about your business? So that's where, that's where Jacob's at. So um, that's pretty radical. God, uh, he was, uh, and what God was, uh, what God has promised for us. So what you should, or what should the reality of this be? Jesus standing in the synagogue said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover the sight of the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. Today this scripture is fulfilled in what you're hearing. So this was Jesus saying something now. That's the promise of God. So let me paraphrase it slightly here. I have been empowered to share the good news with the economically and spiritually poor. So Jacob, he's praying for a blessing, right? What is our blessing? What is what we're praying for here? We're praying that we can help the economically and spiritually poor. I like that term. Because that's what these people outside these walls are. You go right across the street. I can see these people out in the yard every Sunday. They don't go to church. 
I don't know what's going on in their life. I don't know if they've been burned in church. I don't know. I don't know if they're atheist. I don't know if they're Muslim. I don't know anything about them. The fact of the matter is, though, our responsibility is to help those that are out there. And that's what we're entitled to do. That's what we're supposed to do through prayer is maybe send someone into their life that's going to change them. That's what we're supposed to do. So God's promise for the world is simply that He's going to send somebody or to tell others about it. Uh, radical prayer calls us to speak out in spiritual defiance of the world as it is now. It's pretty good, right? We've got a law that was just passed this week, didn't we? Or they're talking about it. To where gender neutral now, a grown man in his whatever can claim to be a woman and go into a restroom with a young girl. Exactly. But this is the law of our land that's going to be passing. By the way, I'm going to start a thing called Failed Fathers Against Ignorant Lawmakers. And we're going to start a nonprofit to get some of these people out of office because that's what needs to happen. But so this is the kind of thing that's going on in our land. So we need to be radical prayers to get some of this garbage taken care of. We pray against injustice, oppression, violence. Uh, like Amos, and when we demand that justice roll down like waters and righteous like a, an ever-flowing stream. We plead this case of the orphan and the widow and whoever the helpless ones are. That's what we are to do as radical prayers. Now, we'll get back to Jacob in a minute, but all of this is what we are called to do through radical prayer. My wife has uh, a heart for um, the unborn, for... Uh, uh, those that are committing these atrocities in our in our world period that are killing unborn children. Now, if that's happened to you, if you've been one of those that have done that, I'm not judging you, but we need to stop that now. We need to stop that from occurring. And she was asking the other day, we were talking about what can you do? Well, we have an obligation to cry out for those who can't be hell or for those who can't be heard. And so it is our job, and I love that the pastor is pushing this agenda now of supporting choices, uh, supporting things like that in our community. That is what we are called to do. Those that are that are that can't take care of themselves. And that's not always an infant, unborn infant. It could be anybody out here on the street that can't take care of themselves. It could be any homeless person. It could be your neighbor for that matter. If they can't speak for themselves, that's what we are to do spiritually is to speak for them. We have to change our prayer lives. Uh, we have to, in our prayers, we need to stand against racism, sexism, nationalism, ageism, and every other kind of ism that you can come up with. That is our job as Christians. Whether we get active in the community or not, we can pray for this. And when we change our prayer lives to where it means something, we can get things done. Because right now, I know God hears our prayers, all right? I'm not questioning that. But when you go to God and say, bless me, and then you walk away, and that's your prayer. Or you go to God and say, God, you said right here in your word, this. You told me in your word to, to stand up for those unborn children that couldn't stand up for themselves. You told me in your word to do that. That's what I'm doing right now. Lord, help me to figure out a way to help you do this thing. Now, which one's he going to hear? Which one's going to have more of an impact? Which one's going to get a result from that? So how do we change our prayers so that we're more in tune with what God wants us to do? Walter Wink writes that radical prayer is impertinent, persistent, shameless, and unbecoming. Well, that doesn't sound good, does it? He didn't give us any good thing that said there. It is more like haggling, and this is him writing this, but I liked it. It's more like haggling in an outdoor bazaar than being or than polite monologues of our church. We hear somebody pray in church, and I'm not knocking any prayers in our church, okay? Trust me, I'm not saying that. How we pray in here, you pray however you want to, how you feel led from God, that's fine. But when we become that agonizer in prayer, when you hear, and, and you've all heard them, You've all heard those prayers at one time in your life in a church somewhere in a prayer setting to where you heard somebody talking to God who was agonizing with God about wanting to see something change. I remember when my mom was very sick. She was in the hospital. We didn't think she was going to make it out. I went down to the chapel. It's a Catholic church, so you know, 
I wasn't praying to a priest or anything, but I was just using it as a setting. Wow. Okay. Yeah. What time is it? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm not even getting halfway through this. So, uh, but anyway, I began to pray, and I believe this with all my heart. Uh, they were telling us that she had an aneurysm. It didn't look good. That she wasn't going to leave the hospital. Man, I got on my knees in that little chapel there at Memorial Hospital. And I'm talking, couldn't cry anymore. I was out of tears. I was prostate on the floor. Prostrate. Thank you. Thank you. It wasn't prostate. Yeah, I was probably examined there, but I was, at least I knew I was wrong. Uh, but anyway, I literally was on my hands and knees on this chapel. And I was crying out to God. God, give me more time. God, give me more time with my mom. Help her. Somehow you've got to do something. For an hour and a half, I was just bellowing, crying out to God. I believe He answered my prayer because she went home from that. We got to spend another about a year uh, after that with my mom. And I believe that that day, I, I called out. I had a Bible with me. I was laying on that Bible. I was calling out everything I could remember about what God had told me in His Word and how He was going to bless us. And I believe that my mom should have died that day. But yet, God gave me more time. Now, is it me? No, it wasn't me. It was God that did it. But there are times, and, and maybe I'll get to finish this up in a few weeks, but we'll see prayers that changed God. It even says in the Bible, but God repented. Well, did that mean God did something wrong? No. But because He loves us so much, and even though we see in times we think of Jonah in the you know belly of the whale, we think of all these things, God sometimes, does He change His mind? No, but the circumstances change us. I, we change through our prayer lives, and God will sometimes redirect because we change. And sometimes that's what it takes. And so we'll get into that maybe here in a few more weeks talking about radical prayers. But I want us to start changing our prayer life. Now, again, there's a couple things, and I'm going to finish with this, and then, then like I said, we'll do this uh, another time. But if you have sin in your life, guess what? God will hear your prayer. But let me throw this out. Most of us here, some of us don't have kids. But... When a kid comes to you and they just, you sit there and say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. I can remember telling my son, he was in a store one day, he picked up this Nerf thing, I said, put that down before you whack, right in my eye. I mean, just pegged me right in my eye. Man, if I could have caught him, I'd have beat him right there in the store. My anger had swelled up, but I was mad at him. And even though I was mad at him, it didn't change how I felt about it. Now, what I'm getting at is, though we do some things wrong and there are consequences to sin, we have to make sure that we clear the air up between God and us too. Are you going to get, if he had come to me right then and said, Dad, hey, can I get this? I'd have been like, no, you're not getting that. I'm still angry with you. It didn't change the fact that I loved him, but it does change that relationship that you have during that time. Sin does the same thing to us in our prayer life with God. If we have unforgiven sin, if we have unrepentant sin, if we're living continuously in sin, and then you go say, God bless me, guess what? God's going to go, wait a minute now. I love you. I want to bless you. But you need to take care of this problem first. Then when you get that taken care of, we can get our, sin, our prayers answered. But we have to make sure that we clean ourselves. Now I say that, clean ourselves up. It's not right. We need to get that, that wall broke down between us and God. Because that's what sin is. It puts a barrier up between us and Him. It's not that He doesn't hear us. It's not that we're not His. It's just that that needs to be taken care of before God can bless us truly the way we want to. Just like a child who's done something wrong, you want to give them the good things, but you're not going to bless them with ice cream right after they burn the house down, are you? That's probably not what's going to happen. So we need to make sure we take care of that before we can really start to change our prayer lives. So... Make sure you clean or you clean your heart up that you ask God for forgiveness because if you haven't got that forgiveness taken care of, then you can't start praying radically. The other thing I'll say and then we'll finish is if you don't know the Bible, it's going to be really hard to go to God and say, God, you said. 
we're going through reading the Bible right now. I just I, I don't do the the thing. I just start in the front and work my way through. That's the way I've always done it. I've been through the Bible a handful of times. I got to Ruth and somehow I've got installed, but I I got to keep going past Ruth now. But um, you have to read the Bible to know what it says. You have to spend time with God to know who He is. If you don't do that, you're not going to have a radical prayer life. I'm sorry. You, we're going to hold God to His promises. That's what radical prayer does. It's, it holds Him to His Word. If you don't know His Word, you can't do that. So I want to see it start changing. I want to see us all start changing in church and in our prayer lives. And it's got to come through knowing this Word first. So we'll pray right there and be dismissed.